right, everybody. Today's panel is on Mississippi success stories, navigating growth and overcoming channels, challenges. Uh, my name is Rena White. I am uh, a partner in a local investment partnership called Twain Capital. We do lower middle market investments in uh, real economy businesses, which are profoundly different from the businesses these gentlemen are going to describe, where farm equipment, energy logistics, uh, fun stuff like that. But we've got two panelists in amazing deep tech companies uh, with us here today. We've got Joe Stratinger with Edge Theory, which is an AI narrative intelligence company. And Joe, I'm going to ask you to explain to everybody what exactly that means. And Michael Grasso with Andrew's Rocket Motor Systems. So what I'd like to do today is walk the group through your background up until your current roles. So this might feel a little bit like a one-on-one -on -one interview before we pivot to more of a panel conversation, if that's okay. And then we'll save some time at the end for questions from the audience and I think some raffle giveaways by April. So uh, Michael, starting with you, Michael Grasso graduated from Georgetown School of Foreign Service, started his career in aerospace and defense consulting, uh, had a very cool gig as the economic advisor for space to the Luxembourg Minister of the Economy and the Luxembourg Space Agency. Would love to hear the story of how you ended up in Luxembourg. Uh, then led co the corporate strategy team at Blue Origin, which is a commercial space flight company founded by Jeff Bezos of Amazon fame. Michael then led biz, biz ops and government relations at Adranos, which is a manufacturer of next gen solid rocket motors for national security and commercial aerospace applications. And Adranos was acquired by Anduril earlier this summer. And so, uh, Michael, if you could uh, explain what it is that the rocket motor systems of Anduril does, where you're located, how long you've been doing this, what's your product or service, what kind of customers are you serving? Absolutely. All right, let's see if this works. It does work. Super. So um, let me first just say what Anduril is. Anduril is a uh, venture capital-backed defense prime. What is a defense prime? Defense Prime contractors are big companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman that build the aircraft, uh, the weapon systems, uh, the maritime systems that keep, us, that keep us safe. So all those capability that you see getting deployed all across the world, the Defense Primes are those companies that design, develop, and build those systems at scale. Anduril is a uh, startup version of one of those companies that was founded on the premise of designing and developing critical capability for the warfighter uh, at its own expense, developing that in-house, um, not relying on the government to pay for the development of new technology, but to do it uh, where we thought uh, it would have the most value for the Army, Navy, Air Force, Space Force, Missile Defense Agency, and the like. Uh, and bringing that capability to, uh, to the customer. Uh, the company has grown very, very, very quickly over the last six years. Uh, it's grown from 10 people to over 2,500, which is just extraordinary. The company is headquartered in Orange County, California, but it has facilities all across the United States. Um, I joined Anduril through an acquisition in June. Uh, I was previously part of, as Rena mentioned, a company called the Duranos, which was a manufacturer of solid rocket motors. What the heck's a solid rocket motor? Well, it's basically a tube with explosives that powers every single missile uh, that is built uh, all across the world. So every missile that we see in Ukraine, every missile that we see you know, in Israel at the moment, almost all those systems are going to be powered by a solid rocket motor. Solid rocket motor uh, takes uh, fuel, uh, uh, an oxidizer, and a rubber uh, binder, mixes it together in a gigantic bread mixer. I'm, I'm not getting like a Baker Perkins style thing. Mills it up. Um, you cast it, make it solid, put a case on the outside of it, a nozzle on the back end, an igniter on the other, and you got a solid rocket motor. Um, and that's, that's what we build. Uh, it sounds a little simple, but what's complicated about it is really two things. One is the chemistry, so making sure you get the ingredients right. You know, when you're dealing with explosives, you don't want to screw that up. And the second thing is being able to manufacture those systems at scale. And one of the reasons, and I'll, I'm, well, I'm sure we'll talk about this, that we're in Mississippi 
is because we were the very happy recipients of one of the very few munition production facilities in the United States. Uh, we called it our Mississippi Miracle. Uh, you can probably guess there are not many places in the world or in the United States where you can build explosives. Uh, there was an abandoned explosives manufacturing plant in Stone County, Mississippi. Uh, we looked, and let me tell you, we looked literally everywhere to build rocket motors. And everyone said the same thing. We got exactly what you need, and yada, yada, yada. And nobody ever had anything, and then uh, Mississippi did. And so we moved to Mississippi in 2020, um, and uh, you know, now have about 50 people at that facility uh, from, from zero, uh, not, not three years ago. Uh, but that's what we do uh, in Andrel Rocket Motor Systems, and uh, that's what we do in Mississippi. Did I miss anything, or is that? No, that was, All right, cool. that was perfect. Uh, this, the answer to this question might be self-evident because you're building rocket motors, but what's the most fun part <laughs> of working with Anduril? I think it's the, wow, that's a, that's a tough question. So I've, I've, I've done aerospace and propulsion stuff for about 10 years, and uh, I would say that most companies that build rocket engines, they take, they take a lot of time. They go very, very, very slow. There's a, the risk tolerance is not very high. Right? And the thing about Anduril is they're willing to take risks, they're willing to put things on the test stand, light them on fire very, very quickly to see if they work and to get capability developed. So the best part for me as um, the head of sales for Anduril's rocket division is you know, knowing that we're, if we make a promise to a customer, we're, I know that we're gonna get that capability, that rocket motor on our test stand and fire it very, very quickly. Awesome. All right, and so next I'll Turn to Joe. Joe is a MC College grad. He began his career with Arthur Anderson as a financial consultant and CPA in Dallas. While with Arthur Anderson, he went to Budapest, Hungary, where he worked on privatizing businesses in post-Soviet uh, Eastern European governments. Subsequent to that, he co-founded MusicForce.com, an internet startup in Dallas. And that company was the first one to sell music online via CDs. He sold Music Force to Gaylord Entertainment in Nashville, and at Gaylord, Joe ran BizDev and created Gaylord Digital to integrate digital commerce into all of the company's assets from hospitality, sports, and entertainment. Then he came back home to Mississippi, thank you for that, and eventually founded Edge Theory, partnering with Jim Barksdale and some very other talented folks. So Joe, explain to us what AI narrative intelligence is and means, what your company does, who you serve, where you're located. Sure. Um, uh, we're located, uh, a lot of different folks, but we, we, we do AI-powered narrative intelligence, and um, it sounds sort of techy, but um, we're deep in AI, but we study narratives. Um, and we all, every one of us in this room, get hit by narratives every day through social media, through messaging, through websites. And so we consume publicly available information from everything from TikTok to Twitter to whatever is publicly available. And we consume those narratives online and are able to show people how narratives start, spread, grow, and cause impact. Whether that narrative causes health outcomes, uh, people not to accept a COVID, vac a COVID vaccine, or the narrative uh, causes elections to be won, or the narrative causes wars to be won, or the narrative causes a stock price to tumble. And so we study online narratives, and we do that through AI using lots of math, um, uh, I'd love to, on another discussion, talk to people about AI. People don't even know what they're talking about half the time they talk about AI. But AI is not a human. Uh, it is math. It's a very, very sophisticated math. And we use math to uh, fingerprint articles, fingerprint videos. And when we put DNA to every single article by, say, a Russian adversary, we can tell you exactly what that Russian is saying. And we can show you how people talk similarly online. So narratives have been around forever since the beginning of man, but today with the, the radical amplification of social media and way beyond that, um, they're very, very powerful. And so if you look today, um, Israel, Israel is losing the narrative war. Hamas is winning the narrative war. If you look at Ukraine and Russia, although Ukraine doesn't have much left, they're winning the, the, the narrative war. Um, and so narratives all around us. Um, and uh, we see that, uh, so I, I, my, my background, I'm a recovering CPA. That's how I started my career. Um, but uh, I started in Dallas and, and, and loved it and then got fortunate to go over. It's funny now, we're, but 1991 was an interesting time when communism had fallen in 89. And so I was 
a green bean, 22-year-old, but I learned a lot doing a lot of privatization throughout Eastern Europe. Came back to Dallas and then got to know this interesting guy named Mark Cuban, who wasn't who he is today. And long story is I started a company in 1998, and, and how I got into edge theory was um, we, uh, we, we used chat rooms back in 1998 to sell things on e-commerce. And people laughed at us, because that's when Barksdale was doing Netscape, and everybody thought the internet was a place only to browse. But the idea of having a conversation online was a radical thought. And so we would use chat rooms to go into, you know, Joe Christian, Joe Country, whatever, <clears throat> and we would say, hey, would you like to buy music? And they would say, sure, and we'd link them to our website. And that was pretty radical back then. So we did that, um, and that got me on this idea I was raised in the Mississippi Delta, love Mississippi, and I started realizing, you know, not having any idea that social media was going to happen. Of course, this is, I sold the company in 99, but I helped lots of my clients after that in Dallas understand online conversation before social media, and I realized, at least I thought, the world was going to get very, very noisy, very, very noisy. If, if this thing, you know, the internet democratized content, it's going to get really noisy and going to get overwhelming. And so that's why I built the company, was to understand this information environment that bombards every one of us every day. And it's very hard. Our mission at Edge Theory uh, is to accelerate and optimize decision making in this crazy information environment. And so our clients range from uh, Mayo Clinic, a big health system, uh, in Rochester all the way, primarily right now, the DOD uh, and the intelligence community. And so we help people understand uh, how our adversaries do things to us, um, not the hack, you know, think of election security, pretty interesting topic. Uh, we don't focus on the hacking of the machine, of the voting machine, we worry about the hacking of the mind. And it's much easier to hack minds than it is uh, a machine. Um, and so back to missiles, I think what's the interesting thing that we're doing now, we're new probably four years into the government, but um, the government likes maps, they like maps. Um, and um, so we, we can show just like you think of a rocket or just think of a, of a missile, we show that graphically, but that missile is really a narrative and it's being pumped out of Moscow and it's landing on Palo Alto, California because it's a narrative about the Silicon Valley Bank collapsing mm -hmm. because they love to push that narrative to divide Americans. Does that make sense? And so we, we're starting to use the idea of kinetic warfare in our world of non-kinetic warfare. Does that help? No, that was great. That was perfect. So question for you as an AI layperson, you know, AI has become so trendy yep. lately. Every tech company wants to call themselves an AI company. Yeah. How does a layperson distinguish between a real AI company versus a company doing AI washing? Like, what, what's your yeah. framework for parsing that out? Well, yeah, there, there's, there's like the AI powered, we call, use that word, but really, we like to say AI native because that we're literally native into AI. But I think the, the, your point, soon we're going to, AI is going to be like interactive. It's not going to be a word anymore, right? It's going to be so across um, uh, every aspect of what we do. I would say Mark Andreessen, who was the founder of, of, of Netscape when Jim was the CEO, uh, wrote an interesting paper, if you haven't read it, called AI Will Save the World. And in that paper, he then wrote this manifesto, but he talks about the analogy of prohibition with AI, and it's a fabulous analogy. And he says, you know, back in history when we had prohibition, we had... And again, I grew up Baptist, so I don't mean to offend Baptists. We had the Baptists and the bootleggers, right? And the Baptists wanted to destroy the evil technology called alcohol, right? They wanted to get rid of it and, and take it off the, the, the saloon shelves. The bootleggers were said, bring it on, right? We're going to make some money here, right? And, and, of course, that was a poor experiment because that became the mafia. So it wasn't a very good experiment in history. But today we have the same thing going on. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill, and we have – prohibition going on with AI. We have the Baptists, who are people who say AI is evil, it's, it's going to kill us, which it's not. It's very powerful, it's scary, and it needs to be looked at, but it's extremely powerful. Um, and then we have the bootleggers, which is Washington, uh, and we have those that want to you know, do regulatory capture and, and, and not let everybody use AI. And I think right now, we do not need prohibition. AI is not a human, it, is not the, it does not have a soul, it is not the Mago Dei, it is, it is math, and I think we need to educate ourselves. I think the first thing we can start with is just good education. I spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill going around to leadership and explaining what it is and what it's not. And I think um, it's scary. I think the media does not know what it is, and we hear all these different stories. But 
I, I, I believe it's very powerful. I don't believe it's any different than the calculator. It's going to make us better artists. It's going to make us better uh, analysts. It's going to make us better, you know, whatever we are. I think it's a very, very powerful thing. And just like anything in creation, it can be used for good and it can be used, used for bad. Well, my next question is why Mississippi? And Michael, you, you answered this in part already, but uh, when we think about entrepreneurs returning here to start a business, there's always the question of, is this a labor of love for them? Is it an economic imperative for this business to be here? And it's probably a spectrum. So where do you think your business falls on that spectrum of needs to be here versus, you know, we're here because we want to make an impact in this place specifically? Yeah, I, I was fortunate because I had this exit and I was able to, you know, in, 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 in the late 90s, I had no kids. So, so, but we came back here solely for family. I love Mississippi, and, and we wanted to raise a family here. And we've been very fortunate providentially to have an incredible, but it has been a challenge. There's no question. I probably limited maybe the financial side of the balance sheet, you know, by coming here. But clearly from what really matters, it's been the best, best decision I ever made. Um, so I came back for family, not for business. I mean, um, uh, and, and my, my wife's father was much older, was an immigrant from Lebanon, and we felt the calling to, hey, that's the right thing to do. And so that's why we came back. Um, and it's been a challenge, but it's interesting, you know, sometimes we don't get to see the tapestry till later, but it's been interesting to see how it's, it's been hard. And I met, of course, Jim Barksdale, which I didn't know who he was at the, until I met um, Jim. And that's been, of course, uh, a good thing. But I think in reality, um, Mississippi is a wonderful place to, to raise, uh, uh, to, to, to build a business. Um, in my space, in the cognitive space, right, which is narratives, there is no better place than Mississippi. In high, I mean, there is no, I, I spend time in New York, to Boston, or wherever. This is the best place I know of where stories are told and understood and from a literature standpoint. And so I think in my space, we should have hundreds of companies like Edge Theory. And that's my vision. That what I want to do is to make Mississippi be known for businesses like mine, right? Where you want to understand film, you go to LA. You want to understand banking, go to the Carolinas. You want to understand tech, probably Austin over San Francisco. But if you want to understand the cognitive impacts of how narratives impact culture, business, wars, elections, which is the most important thing today, you come to Mississippi. That's my dream, right? So I think, um, it, it, but it, no question has been a challenge. I would say, I don't like how people say sometimes that people you know, do leave and don't come back. The reality is we have amazing people in Mississippi. I, I don't think it's the talent. There is so much great talent in this state. I think our challenge is investment. We have no investment community for the most part, right? We, we don't have anything like we need to to stimulate ideas for capital. So I've always done it. I was blessed to have something, and I had to do it myself. And then, of course, um, I've had some interesting investors, but it's been hard. I think the biggest challenge for me and, and for a business is, is capital in Mississippi. But I do not think it's talent. I think we have a lot of wonderful talent, wonderful people. I'll add a little bit just on the, you know, why – we ended up in Mississippi. So for us, it was strictly business. Uh, I am not from Mississippi originally, I'm from New York. Um, the three other uh, leaders of our company, two of them were from Utah, one of them was from uh, Georgia. And we came to Mississippi for three reasons. I mentioned the first, which is specialized infrastructure. You don't, you don't really find many places where you can build munitions, right? And when I, when I say specialized infrastructure, I mean like, a plant that was built 20 years ago that's cited for like 4.3 million pounds of explosives. It honestly doesn't get better than that. We call it the, we call it the Mississippi miracle because for a little startup like ours, I mean, that's a $100 million facility. $100 million. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, if you're a hardware-rich company, if you are manufacturing and you need a place to manufacture, Mississippi is an amazing place for startups. But I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. The two other reasons why Mississippi made a lot of sense for us um, in addition to the infrastructure. First uh, is talent ecosystem. There are like a half a dozen rocket motor and rocket engine manufacturers in the Gulf Coast. There is an existing talent pool of folks that know how to design, build, and test some of the most complicated propulsion systems in the world all, all across the Gulf Coast. The Gulf Coast, uh, and specifically in, in, in South Mississippi, right? Um, why is that? Well, NASA has one of the biggest test centers uh, for their rocket engines called Stennis, uh, uh, which has accumulated a tremendous amount of venture-backed companies, right? It's companies like Rocket Lab, Relativity Space, also Mark Cuban-backed, um, you know, and because of that and because of their investment, they have started to create this in, in very, very, very impressive ecosystem of, of rocket-knowledgeable people. 
right? So we have had almost no problem hiring folks that know what the heck a rocket is, or know how to design it, or know how to build it, or know how to test it. So that's the, the second thing. Um, and the third thing is, when you are in a hardware business like ours, we're buying nozzles and composite cases and all sorts of stuff from all different companies. What was great about Mississippi is that there's already an ecosystem of companies that build those things. There are companies that build composite cases. There are companies that build nozzles. There, there are academic institutions that specialize in those things, right? And so, you know, and I, I've talked, I, I mentioned this on a, another panel recently. What is great about Mississippi, particularly for aerospace and defense, um, if so, if you're an aerospace and defense startup, I highly, highly, highly recommend uh, looking at Mississippi as a place to you know, design, develop, and do your manufacturing. But there is already an ecosystem, and that flywheel of capability is moving very, very, very quickly. And I think you're going to see more companies um, not only relocate capability to Mississippi. In fact, there was a big event at, uh, in Gulfport, I think it was a month ago, uh, a company called Ocean Arrow. Uh, autonomous uh, vessel company that moved from California, Mississippi, you know, for many of the same reasons that Adranos, now Andrew Rocket Motor Systems, uh, came to came to Stone County. That ecosystem exists. It's important to tap into it. And the minute it starts going, and you have a critical mass, it 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 really just takes off, and you get to take advantage of it. Well, since you both touched on talent, um, help us understand how often you have to go outside Mississippi to find what you need in order to grow your companies or divisions versus stay in state? And do you see any patterns in these sorts of roles? I need to go outside, but these sorts of roles I can find plenty of, like your rocket engineers. Yeah, um, um, for us, again, uh, two things. One, um, we found we need a lot of math. We've learned this over time with, with, with um, deep, deep AI. We need mathematicians. So we, of course, we have students that come out of Columbia to Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech is a big, big discrete math, which I have no idea what that is, but we hire people that way. But, but discrete math is a big deal. I, I tell people, if you have a kid and you want them to be in this future world, they need to understand math, even if they don't like it. I mean, math is a big part of this world going forward. So uh, we'll do that. But what I've been excited about, and it's all been new to me, I have two kids at Ole Miss. I knew nothing about Ole Miss uh, at all. And I have uh, fallen in love with the, the university, got through some connections, got to know Dr. Boyce, and we have an edge theory lab at, run out of Ole Miss where we have 100 students from everything from journalism to public policy to engineering to computer science. Um, and then we have, that's now led uh, by a gentleman, um, and we have every SEC, every SEC school a part of it. We have Montana, South Dakota. So we have, I think that young people are amazing, and we have to tap into those. So for us, partnering with uh, Ole Miss has just given us, we've had 40 alumni come out of the program already. This is in three years. So I think um, uh, we did, while there's technical folks like uh, mathematicians maybe, but I really think if you think about the future of AI, it's not really about computer science and programming. It's much more about uh, critical thinking skills. And when you go to a liberal arts campus, there's amazing critical thinking skills. And so to, to us in our world, the future of AI and the future of, of information, of the information environment that we play in, it's about context and it's about prompting. So like you hear about prompting engineers. I think we're gonna see a world very soon where a student can go to any university, love law, but not go to law school because they love law, but they become the prompt engineer at the law firm in New York City, right? Because they can think cl critically. Same thing with medical school. You love the anatomy, but you don't wanna go to medical school but guess what? You can become the prompt engineer for the CEO of a hospital system. So I think, you know, liberal arts schools, to me, are fascinating, but we still have to have those technical schools. Um, so, yeah, for us, it's, it's definitely, I think there's more talent than we can have right here. That's great. So I think when it comes to talent, there's, okay, there's the hard reality of extremely uh, high uh, interest rates and people who are locked into mortgages that are very attractive. So when we were a small startup, uh, and I'll talk about this, this is as a practical matter, and then I'll talk about, okay, well, you know, let's talk about talent and acquisition in Mississippi kind of across the board if you're in the manufacturing space. But as a practical matter, it was extremely difficult for us to uh, get people to relocate, right? Because who the hell wants to move when you got a mortgage that was, uh, you, know, a, you know, locked in from a couple of years ago and, you know, trying to get a new house now is, is crazy, right? So 
that's tough. That's very, very tough if you're a startup and you got to have X person relocate to, you know, your new production plant um, somewhere else, right? So sometimes, and I think right now, if you are, you know, looking at scaling your business, you're going to have to take into account the reality of the resources that you have and the willingness of folks to move, right? So we have to deal with that. We have a small office in, in Huntsville, uh, Alabama. We've got a few folks in West Virginia. Uh, Huntsville is where, Hunts, both of those locations are where some of our competitors are. They're not moving. We brought the jobs to them. Not Those those job sets are for folks that don't need, they're not bending metal. They're, they're sitting in front of a computer designing rocket motors, right? Now, while that situation is, you know, is what it is, and there's nothing I, our little company can do about, uh, about their ability, these, these folks' ability to get an attractive mortgage, what we can do is partner with uh, Ole Miss, partner with Mississippi State, partner with other institutions um, to get new talent to stay in the state and to come and work for us. So, um, you know, mentioned Ole Miss, we're, uh, we do quite a bit with the Center for Manufacturing Excellence. They've got some fantastic talent when it comes to aerospace engineering. Uh, Professor Darren Van Pelt, uh, for example, who was a SpaceX guy, one of the first employees at SpaceX, started his own rocket company. He's over at Ole Miss teaching aerospace engineers, right? And we're happy to take his students and bring them on as, uh, as interns. We've, we've already done that. And at Mississippi State, uh, the, Advanced Compo- uh, the Advanced Composite Institute um, has become an excellent pipeline for folks. So when it comes to new talent on the engineering side, we're leveraging the institutions that Mississippi has in spades that are excellent um, and you know, bringing folks on board. Now, when it comes to manufacturing talent, um, we're able to work. Uh, we're able to work locally to get folks um, who have experience in welding and, and whatnot, more on the operator level, to come and work at our facility. So uh, we have a partnership with a high school in Stone County, Mississippi. Um, they have a fantastic welding program where uh, they learn the, fa- the the fundamentals of what it takes to be a welder, and we're able to bring them into uh, bring bring them into our facility, not only to learn but ultimately to become employees. Right. So you know. I mentioned the, the, the interest rate, mortgage, blah, 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 uh, to say, you know, you shouldn't just throw your hands up in the air and say, well, you know, whatever, we'll just bring the jobs to where, where those people are located. You gotta, you gotta deal with the reality of that situation, but also plan for the future. Um, and that's what we're doing with the institutions that Mississippi has, both academically, at the university level, and at the local level. When you think about the community technical college system and our four-year universities, is there something more they could be doing to help your businesses grow? Like if you had a, if you could wave a magic wand and they changed course, what would be more impactful for your company? Yeah, I'll go first. So um, let me think about that for, well, I'll I'll, I'll talk while I think about it. (laughs) Um, I, you know, look, I think the, I think that it's always a question of alignment, right? The, the demands of companies, what what I mean by that, like what exactly are they producing? What are the, the types of trades that, uh, and skills that they need are constantly evolving, right? And I think the best way to make sure that um, those institutions are training folks um, and there's going to be jobs lined up on the back end once they are trained is to ensure that those companies are actively having a dialogue with those institutions about the, the workforce projections that they see and the capabilities that they're gonna need. So said another way, like, you know, uh, maybe five years ago, there wasn't as much of a demand for, for welders that were aerospace knowledgeable in Stone County, Mississippi. Now, there's a huge demand because I got to hire 10 people like yesterday to go and do that, right? So it's really important for when it, when it, when it comes to curriculum planning, when it comes to, um, you know, helping folks make sure that they're learning things that are going to be relevant to the actual job. It requires us to engage early and often. Yeah, I think, again, for our... our it's, it's 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 fun to listen to the two sides of our businesses because I'm I'm I, you know I'm in the world of narratives which there is no there is no cost there is no hardware right zero but I think one thing that you know, college can do in the community college level um, is I think really just a, number one have an open mind about AI and and, and where the world's going um, uh, and how to use it for good but I think um, understanding how students um, need, you know, critical thing. I was fortunate where our kids went to schools in Jackson uh, that, that got a lot of critical thinking. But I think, again, these basic things, the two things that matter, I think, in the future are your social skills, which we do quite well in Mississippi, 
right, over anybody in the world. We are, are living here as a venue, right? I mean, really, you think about it. Living here is a venue to understand the art of conversation, which is the future of our world, right? How to listen, think, speak, and analyze. And so I think our schools need to continue to really, so we, we take it for granted, but I think critical thinking skills um, are, are just so, and it's amazing to me, we sometimes get, because of this gentleman who runs our lab, speaks five languages, and he ran the Chinese program at, at, at Ole Miss, and he's fascinating. So we get some of the, the top students, but it's, it's amazing just how uh, uh, people don't have critical thinking skills, you know, um, and I think that's so critical. So I think universities um, should all embrace that, and I think, A, they should be, to, I think we need to listen more to younger people. I mean, we need to have structure, but it is amazing that what our students, what our children have, um, uh, in, in information and knowledge is something that's radically beyond what we can think about, right? And so they're getting bombarded every day, and we just have to embrace that, hey, they're pretty smart. They might be out of control, they might, they might have other things, but these students are, are so intelligent, and we just need to find better ways to tap into that. It might change the way we do curriculum, it might change the way we do, you know, um, so I think that's, we've got to have an open mind. We can't, and as sometimes in a university setting, as I've learned, it's typically they don't move very fast, and I like to move fast, but you know, we have to, I think, be more flexible than probably we have as universities. What are some of the hidden assets or unsung opportunities in Mississippi that your businesses have been able to successfully exploit that maybe more people should be thinking about? I'll go first, and I, I said this before, I'll say it again, because it is literally uh, one of the three reasons why our company got bought in June, much to the delight and joy of our investors. Um, the, uh, one of the hidden gems of Mississippi is the unbelievable amount of open and available industrial space across the state. You can go to MDA, Mississippi Development Authority's website right now, and they will have hundreds of facilities that you can move into tomorrow. So if you're, if you need to manufacture something, uh, if you are doing anything that requires bending of metal or cutting of wood or whatever, um, take advantage of those of those opportunities, right? And um, it could mean the difference. Like you know, okay, if you're, why, why does why does infrastructure matter? Uh, it matters because, and why does leveraging existing infrastructure matter? It matters because you're not wasting time and money building uh, a factory, or having to ra building a building, or having to raise money to build buildings. That's a terrible use of venture money. Terrible, absolutely terrible. You shouldn't raise venture money to go and build buildings. Silly. There, there, are, there are ways to avoid those enormous costs. I told you, our, the cost of our facility, if we were to do a greenfield, it's $100 million, but more importantly, it would have taken us three to five years to do it. Um, now, it's very, very specialized, but if you were to build a sawmill, if you were to do anything, it's going to take time and money, and Mississippi has those facilities. And the way it works is MDA obviously keeps a catalog of all the different facilities, but at a, at a county level, the economic development partnerships uh, more localized are managing what's coming on the market, what's available, and they'll work with you to find um, a good fit uh, for your business. So, you know, if, if you need a site and you want to get going fast, uh, there are sites aplenty across the state. Yeah, I think, um, uh, as I said, in our world infrastructure, I think um, well, some of the, again, I'm, I'm probably repeating myself, but, but I really think it's, it's important for us to understand. We, again, we, in Mississippi, we take this for granted so much, but it, w w based on my exposure, understanding how powerful narratives are, when we grew up in Mississippi, you know, we just don't understand how important it is and, and what we've gained by just being here, understanding how to have a conversation, how to tell a story. And I think, so from an infrastructure standpoint, any company that wants to be able to talk and have salespeople and have, you know, this is one of the greatest places, I think, to find people that have, you know, really good social skills, soft skills, whatever you want to call it. Um, and um, I think we just have to look at that. We, we uh, the industry is massive on the coast, but overall, I think our greatest industry in Mississippi is yet to come. And that is, it is using the, the, the finest gift we have, which is storytelling and conversation and soft skills. I mean, again, I, I go to Palo Alto a lot. I mean, I've had so many people look down upon me. I mean, Barksdale always talks about how people ask me if we had a damn airport here, right? Um, um, so I, I, I get it all the time. You know, I get it all the time. But once someone comes here and they meet someone from here, they don't want to leave, right? And so we have to do a better job, I think, because we, we are going to fight this stigma that we have so much. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've 
been looked down upon like I don't even wear shoes, um, you know, half to, to this day. But, but once people come here and they realize, oh, my gosh, this is a great place to live, and you're, that's a great point. There's a lot of space, you know. Um, but I think we as Mississippi have to do a better job marketing ourselves. I don't think we do a good job as we should on marketing how awesome this space is, not just some sort of economic development, but the people. And I don't know how you do that exactly, but we got to do a better job. So I, I laughed at your airport story because in a past life I was a management consultant traveling across the country. And I definitely had colleagues from, I believe they were from New Jersey, ask me if I traveled to work on a swamp boat. I said, no, I did not. <laughs> So uh, why don't we open it up? So that was such a great optimistic note uh, to pause on. Why don't we open it up to questions from the audience? Come on. <laughs> well, we do controlled explosions all the time. None have blown up on the stand. No, no, we, uh, no, we don't. No, we look. When you're when you're building explosive safety is. Uh, you know, absolutely critical, right? So um, when you are designing and developing a rocket motor, um, some of the first types of articles that you build are what we call heavy walled, uh, not to make everyone's eyes glaze over as we talk about rocket stuff, but like, you know, heavy walled rocket motors. So what's a heavy walled rocket motor? It's a rocket motor with uh, a steel case, steel, like, yay thick, six inches, two, four inches, depending on whatever you're testing. You fill it up with propellant, you light it, it go, you know, you light it on a stand, it goes, right? Um, and using that kind of infrastructure um, really helps us not just develop a capability very quickly, but make sure that the folks are gonna be very safe. Going back to infrastructure, my favorite topic in Mississippi, part of the reason why we're in this facility is because um, it's not just a warehouse, you know, in, in Mississippi's beautiful pine land, it's a building with concrete reinforced walls uh, around three sides, one on the top. So God forbid if there's an accident, um, nobody's gonna get hurt, right? So it's very, very, very specialized infrastructure to deal with explosives. And um, you know, if you're, if you're in the, the business of blowing things up, you gotta have that kind of stuff in place to make sure that your folks are gonna be safe, um, both on the design side and then obviously on the, on the operator side. You know, we at Adranos and now Andrew Rocket Motor Systems have not had as much interaction with uh, with Stennis or or Camp Shelby. I think um, for companies that have and who have done it quite well, they're able to take advantage of two things. Um, one is uh, sort of physical assets that the government has already invested in that are underutilized, right? So test stands. A test stand can like you know cost millions and millions and millions of dollars and take months and months and months and months to build. So if you're able to get your propulsion system on the stand very quickly, it's much to your benefit. And Stennis does a great job at working with folks to you know, take advantage of underutilized assets. Um, you know, and the other thing that I'll say uh, that works is, and you can do this through CRADAs and other agreements, is taking advantage of the technical talent and the resources available uh, at no cost to you um, of the, of the you know, uh, engineers and scientists within the, the federal civil service, right? So when we are designing rocket motors, we're de designing capability, we can um, take advantage of uh, chemists and folks that have, you know, seen and worked with systems over many, many years at Navy, or Army, or Air Force, or, or NASA. Um, and I think a lot of folks don't like, they, they, don't, they don't usually think about those agreements because they're like, well, I want a contract, I want a, I want a sale, you know? But when you're in the development phase, effectively being able to work with those type, through those types of agreements means that you can, in, you know, in effect, scale the folks on your team without having to shell out a lot of money. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, uh, definitely been contacted, um, but we're not helping any sides. Um, uh, 
Um, I mean, we can, you know, again, what we do is we consume public available information, right? And we'll, we can sell that to anybody. Um, it brings up a good point, though, I think, um, uh, one of the things that people hear about, you hear this word disinformation over and over and over. And I keep harping on critical thinking skills and why we need to all have critical thinking skills. Um, and I try to get people, there's a lot of AI fellows going around our Congress right now um, uh, trying to influence folks. And in the, the day, disinformation, which is huge part of politics, disinformation, we are not going to ever stop disinformation. The idea that we can put together a ministry of truth Right? Or the idea that we can uh, uh, have someone tag and watermark content to be known is just a joke. And, I, and, I'm, I, and it's the wrong conversation. The conversation is who is behind the information? Who is behind that narrative? That's, of course, what we focus on. So we are very, very, uh, very, very careful. We do not opine on anything. If you come to our systems, our platform, and you want to look up anything from, you know, uh, uh, Zelensky to, to Hamas to cancer and you want to look at that you can look at that across u.s media middle east media think tanks whatever the modules is and we're not going to ever put any algorithmic bias because today when all of us go to google don't think for one second they're guessing what you want to see right they're guessing and they know your tribe they know that you're right or left and they're going to give you what they want to give you and so we are big on not doing that so I think we're well suited for a political organization if they would like but we've we've been very very focused on the, the, the government um, who approached us about the need for understanding foreign malign influence. So that's where we focus. But uh, I'd happy to talk to anybody. Just a, just a quick follow up because you mentioned Mississippi and kind of the narrative that's been kind of drawn around Mississippi and our culture. It, is that also point to disinformation? Is, is, the, is the true information about Mississippi just not getting out enough or fast enough? I mean, it's this whole narrative about sins of our past, which are serious, right? Uh, but, but we don't put the narrative out there that we've actually addressed our warts, I think, pretty well but compared to most parts of the world. But I don't think, yeah, I think there's a narrative that I always say as a recovering CPA, the narrative is either your greatest asset or your greatest liability, period, end of story. And if you're not out there pushing your own narrative, right, your own story of truth, then you're going to lose. You're going to lose. Um, and so there are, I, I, there are there, this sounds mind-boggling, but this will wake up, you know, people on Capitol Hill, is I can show you graphically, you know, literally, you know, physically showing a, a missile of a narrative coming out of Beijing or coming out of the CCP or whatever and landing on Jackson, Mississippi. This is one of their favorite targets. Y'all don't understand, they, they, and they will take a topic, a sad topic, such as the Jackson water crisis. It's, it's a horrible, embarrassing topic. And we can debate why, you know, what's true, what's not true. But they will take that, that narrative and they will push on the left, you know, the, the arguments of systemic racism. They'll push the right, which is poor leadership, and over and over and over. And they do that every single day. So there's people, I mean, you know, and they do that to divide us at election polls and everything else. But that's happening. If we don't respond with our narrative of how wonderful this place is, we're going to lose. And we're losing. So we study, we study globally everything from, from, from uh, U.S. media to Middle East to North African media to Sub-Saharan African media to Pacific media, European media, the whole world. And we study not just media organizations but lots of other things. We study the Duma, Parliament, U.S. Congress, etc. And if you look at that across the board and you look at any – you can turn on the TV too, but don't, they're not telling you oh, – they're telling you what they want to tell you. It's a story. But if you look at all that across the board, there's no – there's clear, clear – it's clear evidentially – that Hamas, the Hamas-Palestinian narrative, is clearly winning over the Israel narrative. Just from, from both volume. So both the volume of um, people who are speaking positively them versus Israel. Yeah, well, we'll just, we'll just right, wrong, true, false, whatever, the, 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 uh, the Palestinian narrative is winning. Um, there are young people on TikTok today that have no idea even what the history 
of this conflict is about, because it goes back to a guy named Abraham. It's pretty deep, right? <laughs> you know, if you want to talk about history. There are kids on TikTok that have no idea how, of the serious nature of this conflict, and they go to TikTok, this crazy platform, which don't get your kids on TikTok, and they, there are kids that are on TikTok that are pushing a narrative they completely think is immoral and wrong because they'll get more play and they'll get more likes. Does that make sense? So now you have a problem with algorithms and social platforms where people are joining a narrative that they don't even agree with. And, that, and that's very evident with Israel and Palestine right now. Is that helpful? Yeah, it's just, it, it, it's the, it, you know, really it's just like, the, maybe it's the secret sauce. And when you say that that narrative is one and over, and you know I'm a data guy, I like to say, yeah. oh, it's the 500 mentions on TikTok versus yeah. 10, or there's 20 CNN stories that rank positive versus the one. That's yeah. What I was so we do. I mean, I think the, the, think of us. You know, there's a difference. Everybody's heard of social media monitoring, which you sort of alluded to with sentiment tracking. Those world that world's dying quickly because sentiment analysis is very hard to do. Number one, no matter if people tell you they can do it, it's 50 percent wrong half the time because of satire and irony. Right? When you say my brand has positive sentiment or negative sentiment, but with generative AI now, the information environment is so big, sentiment analysis is very tough. But more, social media monitoring, meaning how many people are talking on Twitter about this or Telegram or Reddit or whatever, that gives you a pulse, you know, uh, that, hey, people are talking about Chinese spy balloons or people are talking about climate change or whatever. But when you, what we do is we go deeper into the actual narratives, the blogs, the videos, and we don't give you the pulse. We give you the MRI and how that narrative started, who started it, and how it spread and grew. And then we know data-wise who's behind the narrative, and we know their reach. I think we had a question over here. Well, yeah, I don't know all the details, but the answer is we don't need our kids on TikTok. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's the scariest platform out there by far. Um, um, I don't know exactly all the ownership, and you hear all these different stories, but um, I would... Uh, um, Kids have no idea the information they just give away every day. But I think it's, uh, do I think it's part of the information warfare? Absolutely. You know, I mean, it, well, we call this, you call this the gray zone. It's time in between conflict, right? And, and, and I don't mean China. I mean the CCP, the Communist Party. Um, they do not look at war. We think of war and peace and war. They don't, it's every day. And, and, and there is information being spread on platforms like TikTok and many others every single day to influence people to think a different way. And that war is bigger than any kinetic war. And I would argue we need to think much more serious about it, right? Because we build ships that are very expensive that we're never going to be used because we have things called nukes. We're not going to nuke someone, but we have to have those things for posture. But the real war is on the hearts and minds of us that we get influenced every day, every day. And our kids, you know, they, they you know, I started my career, there was no internet. Right. But so I, I think differently, but they have no young people have no idea anything but the world of information. Does that make sense? And, and, and they don't. And again, back to critical thinking skills. Again, I might say disinformation. The answer is not, is this true or false? The answer is who's behind it. And we as humans and our kids and our grandchildren need to think, be able to think more critically. That's the only way we're going to win, is to be able to think critically. We're not going to stop the world from media. We're not going to stop information from happening. That would be stopping the world. I hope the world doesn't stop anytime soon. So the answer is we need to be critical thinkers to say, is this really a good source? Is this person known to push false narratives? Does that make sense? So, um, and, and TikTok's just so fast. And what really is scary lately is how, you know, people are, there's studies coming out how people are using platforms Again, on an issue that's so clear and evident, you know, a terrorist organization, but we're going to go push that narrative because it's going to get me more likes. That is, let that sink in. That's very scary. Very scary. I mean, the classic example is the, is the, is the hospital. I was in Washington that night when all that happened with the, the, the Hamas, you know, the, the, the narrative we all jumped on, New York Times, everybody, you know, that, that, that the hospital was blown up. That, y'all, that went on, if you go study in defense, there was kinetic things that happened, real things, people dying because of that narrative. Does that make sense? I mean, that narrative, you know, caused a lot of other people not to meet, which caused 
it's people to kick in doors. And so, you know, but I, but talking about defense, bring it back home to like business. Like my first business, my first boss runs Mary Kay, a great company, you know, a makeup company. And it's not just about, you know, uh, uh, adversaries as race to the, 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 our country. If you're a business owner, you need to understand the narratives of where your business is, right? If, if you really want to study a business, and I would argue as a recovering CPA, you know, I, back in the days, you know, you could look at a financial statement, and if, if, a, if a big four accounting firm opined on that financial statement, you know, you knew it was a pretty good investment to make. But today, if you don't understand the narrative health of a business, you could be really, really making a mistake, right? So we as business owners need to understand, what is my narrative? I do not mean from a marketing play, how many people like me. I mean, if I have a business and I, and I have a supply chain for makeup, and makeup comes from soap, and soap is in Malaysia, I better look at the narratives in Malaysia every day. Because if something happens in Malaysia, right, civil unrest or something, and screws up my supply chain, I'm in trouble. Does that make sense? So just like in warfare, you need to understand. So I think it's not just, I know I'm talking a lot about, I get excited about adversaries, and, but it's really every business owner needs to understand their narratives. Thank you for these questions. I think we're at time. Gentlemen, thank you both so much. Thank you.